Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. For over 30 years, Trakel has been obsessed with the art of brush making, and now they're applying that same obsession to professional grade artist panels. Both their brushes and panels are made right here in California at their Hesperia factory. Go to Trakel.com and use promo code SAVVY16 to get 15% off your next order. Langdon Quinn is a native of Atlanta, Georgia. He lives in the Hudson Valley, east of Troy, New York, and spends several months of the year in central Italy. So you might remember hearing his name on this podcast before. And that's because a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing his wife, Karen Canier, about her painting and her collage work. Also, Kathleen Speranza talks about how much Langdon inspired her painting at Boston University. Langdon is a representational painter who has exhibited widely, both nationally and internationally, since receiving his MFA in painting from Yale University in 1976. His imagery is derived from both observation and invention. His subjects are landscape, interiors, figure, and still life, or combinations thereof. In this interview, Langdon graciously talks about some of his recent paintings that have not yet been exhibited or published on his site. So I recommend that you take a look at those in the show notes at SavvyPainter.com. Langdon talks about the genesis of two paintings in particular, Queen Mob Decides and Queen Mob Relents and how their evolution is indicative of his painting process. He also talks about his teaching career and how that has informed his work. We go over a typical day in the studio, plus some of the artists who have influenced him, from early Italian Renaissance painters to Cezanne and Bonnard. Langdon and his wife Karen have been going to Italy every summer for decades. These pilgrimages have had an enormous impact on Langdon's work, and you can see it in the landscapes he paints on his farm there and in the figures he creates in his studio. Langdon is the recipient of many awards, including a Fulbright Fellowship, a Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Grant, a National Endowment for the Arts Grant, and two Ingram Merrill Foundation Grants. He is also a member-elect of the National Academy of Design in New York City. His paintings and works on paper are in prominent public and private collections, both here and abroad. Here is Langdon Quinn. Langdon, thank you very much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast with me. I very much appreciate your time and agreeing to be on the show with me. You're welcome. I'm glad to do it. Can you tell us a little bit about your background um, in terms of when you really decided that you were going to dedicate your life to painting? Yes, I can. Like many people, I had the benefit of a really, really wonderful high school teacher. And that man came to be a a model for me that changed over time in all the years I knew him, which which continued well into my adult life up until when he died, which was in 1995. When I left high school and went to my undergraduate school, I decided to be a pre-med major when I entered college. And within a couple of years, that wasn't working out. And I got in the car with a friend of mine. I drove back to Connecticut to visit this man and saw him and his work and his, his family and the place he lived and, more importantly, the way he lived. And he became a model for me not only in terms of things I valued in his work, but the way he lived life and the way he never wasted a moment and was dedicated to his work. He was a man always in full stride. And I I just admired his passion. And I said, that's the way I want to be and live. I interviewed Kathleen Speranza for this show. And oh, yeah, yeah. she credits you with as being the person most responsible for introducing her to painting. And as an educator herself now, she said, I hope I've been able to pass the baton to some other crazy painter in the endless chain. Well, okay, she was, I remember Kathy, I call her, very fondly. And she was certainly the, 
the best student I had when I taught at Boston University, and I believe her class would have been about 1982. And she, I think I could still dig up some slides I have of hers somewhere, but she was enormously talented. And, you know, it's been nice to see that she has, in fact, gone on, I suppose, and doing good things. And I see her on Facebook and know that she's out there working and working well. I've seen beautiful things at first. So, good. But I'm glad, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I had something to do with it, and I, I appreciate her saying whatever good things she said about me. From that, I'm curious how, you know, from Kathy's comment and from what you were speaking about with regards to the high school teacher that inspired you to start this journey, how has teaching informed your own life and your work? I taught in high school for four years, and that was incredibly difficult because I was only about four or five years older than my students. And it was a boarding school. There were two boarding schools. I taught at a boys' school and a girls' school simultaneously in Connecticut and sort of went back and forth between the two. And so the whole in loco parentis thing was in place, which complicated it even more. But Wait, what was that? In loco parentis, meaning that you had to be a sort of surrogate parent since it was a boarding school. They were boarding school. Gotcha. So that was... Probably the four hardest years of teaching in my 35 years of teaching was <laughs> doing that because I was not much older than they were. And they try, I mean, it was complicated, but they, they, they tried to treat me as a peer and I tried to treat them as a peer as much as I could within the confines. But still, in the classroom, from a pedagogical point of view, it was also difficult because I had I had to be certain about what I was saying without being dogmatic and just doctrinaire. It was hard to be dogmatic and doctrinaire when I was still working out these problems myself and, and what, what I knew and what I could teach and what I could communicate. So... Um, that was a very difficult time. So it all got easier after that, I should say. And because by the time I had gone through graduate school, I had some pretty pretty strong and somewhat tested experience to speak and paint out of. And that, that parallel changes in my own work. And those things that became important to me in my work found their way into my pedagogy in one form or another. So the two went hand in hand for many, many years, decades, in fact. So, Can you talk a little bit about your work? And I'm curious to know what you feel like is the common thread throughout that time, because you talk about 35 years of, of teaching and painting. With the exception of those first couple of years teaching in high school, it became clear to me that my strengths, both in my own work and in my pedagogy, had to do with being able to teach about working from observation. So regardless of the complexity of the issues that my students brought to me or whatever curriculum issues there were in teaching, in graduate, teaching graduate students at the University of New Hampshire, which was my last full-time job, and how we we had a seminar, a class having to do with narrative painting and developing things based on literary narrative. So that, that sort of represented an end of things, which had to do with invention and metaphor and trying to discern the difference between a pictorial narrative and a literary narrative and what were the differences. In other words, how you could avoid the illustrative in narrative painting, and and how you could make a painting that brought various threads of information, whether they might be work from observation, sketches, drawings, photographs, together to make a sort of synthetic ensemble that added up to an expression of something that was based on a story or a novel, uh, but was not just illustrative of a particular event in that in that story. So that I'm I'm putting that on one end of the spectrum, but the other end would be you know sitting in front of a still life and 
looking at the light break across the forms and talking about the color in relationship to the light, all the things that are just so fundamental to working from life and understanding how color and light work in some observable way. And those have been the underpinnings, I'll say, that is invention and or working from observation. They've been the underpinnings of 35 years of teaching and and also even longer for my own work. Right. Where do you feel like your work falls on that spectrum? Well, the slides I just sent you that have not appeared on the website, but I have examples on the website that are similar, represent. I think I sent four four slides, and at least one of them is done completely from life with a French easel set up on the spot. And the other is Barry and their departure from strict observation, but they, at least one that I sent you, is completely invented or based at least in memory of a particular place. The ambition is to is to wed whatever skills or strengths I have as an observational painter to invented imagery. So a moment ago, you asked me about where I where it falls on the spectrum. I'm I'm still trying to synthesize those two things and always have been, but I'm trying to push as I get older, trying to push in, into more of an invented realm. And I think that I know something about my own form sense at, at this point and how my own palette, the sense of color and light, I want to imbue something with to have this a, a sort of psychological quality to it and see see how I can combine that with invented imagery. So that's the program at the moment, and it has been for a long time. But more than ever, I think that I trust whatever I've learned through observation to be embedded in inventive things that I do now. Was it difficult to trust that? Yeah, yeah, it it is. I think I've made a jump. I used to say and to believe that I could paint something from my imagination If I could remember it or I had seen it, if I had walked past some street corner and seen some combination of things happen, which which I'm thinking about a painting I did in 1980 when I lived in the North End in Boston. And it was a a sort of encounter of a group of people on a a street corner in the North End. And I went back into my studio and immediately started working out sketches and and ideas. in the service of this thing that I had seen, observed. And I could summon all the things. And I, if I needed to go out and check what a storefront looked like, I could just walk down the street and do it and then go back to my studio with a drawing or just a memory of it and, and paint it. So that was the point at which I could I realized I could pull these things together, my, my wish to sort of recreate a world that I had just observed. But to get back to your question, there was a point in time when I said I need to have seen it, experienced it, then I can begin to pull the things together that I need to in order to picture it, to image it. Now, I'm a, I am think, or at least I'm, I'm working out of the belief that I can push it beyond that. I mean, I, I don't have to have seen it. I have to have some information, but I can run with the information and the large painting, the landscape that I sent you called Cimitero 3 is a painting that it's of a place that I drive by all the time, but I'm seeing it from above. I've, so I've essentially just rotated all the observable information out there in the landscape and imagine what it would look like seeing it from above. So it's, combines both an actuality but also a point of view that's completely made up and so i'm seeing things behind walls that i don't really i can't see but i'm imagining so it's uh it's an exercise and i'm stretching i'm stretching my capacity to you know to to 
trust myself and trust my whatever skills I have to convey what I'm trying to convey. So that's sort of new territory, but it's not terror. You know, I've, I've taken chances like that all along. And there are other questions that you have about at least the way I heard them or read them about what I consider a success. Yeah. And I, at various times, had thought, oh, well, you know, I pushed myself to do that, and it was it worked. It worked out okay. Then 10 years later, I look at it and I say, oh, terrible. And, <laughs> and I know by now not to trust any momentary judgment about something I do as being anything except subjective because – and I'll probably hate it next week or next year or something. Oh, but, wow. Yeah. So I, I know not to do that. But that's been the trajectory for a, a long time, which is to bring the work that I do from observation, drawing, landscape painting, still life painting, everything done from observation to larger, more inclusive context, which, which borrows more from the imagination. Right. Right. And anybody looking at my website for any length of time will see those things, I think, that uh, there are paintings that are quite ambitious in terms of bigger composition or this or that, that I, I think fairly clear are not strictly observed. There's a lot of invention in them. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm not sh sure if you would immediately, like, they don't look obviously made up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. These are actual places. There's a feeling to them, though, that I think sort of brings that in. The composition and the way that you pull it together, I think, is what makes it feel like, okay, it's not strictly realistic. It's not strictly observational. Yeah. If that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> Good. Good. I know. I, I, I like to think that that is clear and anybody looking at a range of work. There are paintings I could cite. The a painting done in 1990 called a studio view which on my website is under i think it's in the figure section but it is a cutaway view of a male figure poised at a midpoint between a room on the right and a landscape on the left and he is sort of caught between the two worlds so that's not something that it's the building hasn't been cut away it's an invention right and it's a painting that's important to me because I felt like it was something of a breakthrough that I could... That you could make things up? Yeah, that I could make make that kind of thing up. And I must say that behind that, whatever confidence I had in order to even attempt it, was a lot of study of Italian painting, particularly 1300s, Trecento, Sienese painting. Because they did things like that all the time, and it, they were so inventive and so absolutely liberated to do anything that it gives anybody interested in invented imagery permission to try something. Right. It's just, it's just so so evident that they they just were wildly inventive, and they had a, a receptive audience to it. So it's as I say, it's just something of a kind of permission for somebody like myself who I haven't spoke, spoken about going to Italy, but it is has been vitally important to my whole development. I'm curious. I want to talk about Italy, but I'm also kind of curious about something that you just said, because it feels like observational painters in particular, I think, but artists in general, we seem to somehow like when we're going to switch gears or try something new, it's almost like we need permission to do that. And this, I, I, this is going to be a strange question, but what is that all about? Why do, why does that happen? Why do we need that? I think that conventions for representing things that we, you know, it's such a slow prodding process that if you can get a apple to sit on a tabletop in a painting you know, it requires that you can do build a plane, you put a volume in it, you break a light across it. It sits there or it doesn't sit there. <laughs> and, you know, you get gravity to sort of manifest itself in something like that, then you that's an accomplishment. That but it's such a 
tiny little accomplishment, really, in this whole scheme of things, that it's pretty hard to make big jumps after that. It takes a long time. Yeah. And so it just, it's a sort of climate of doubt and, I don't know, pace that self-education, which is essentially what it is, instills in us. So it doesn't make us, when I say us, I mean a, a community of people for which that's important, meaning being able to put a form in space with light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's challenging. I mean, being able to create plasticity, believe in it. It's something that these painters I'm talking about in the 1300s and Siena could could do and and certainly the Florentines with their accomplishments and perspective and everything else had a different kind of language for it but nonetheless they ran with it to such a degree that it's kind of daunting for anybody that knows anything about art history to even think that we're in a conversation with them <laughs> but we are I think Ideas about progress and advancement in one's own work or in the art world at large, you know, are completely arbitrary and capricious. The progress you make as a painter or I make as a painter is, is something, you know, we have to believe in. But it's hard to it's hard to think of yourself making huge jumps if they don't have credibility if they don't have weight or meaning to you and those things are sl slow and evolving yeah when you're speaking of those jumps are you speaking of those as personal jumps within your own painting context or are you thinking also about jumps in painting with a capital p like historical painting well you've heard it said i'm sure that you always paint the same painting one always paints the same painting. And it just, over a lifetime, you're essentially painting the same painting. And I think I understand that. It's a, it's a sort of shop-worn thing to say, but it's, I think it's true. You have a sense of form. You have a sense of how things ought to look. And you, you paint out of that. And again, I'm talking about a community of people that are genuinely involved in representation and believe in it and are moved by it. And I'm not talking about anything trendy or hip or marketable or commercial or, or conceptual or anything else. I'm talking about a very traditional idea about representation and painting. My sense of change in my work and my sense of having made incremental the increments are small the increments are yeah. small they feel big at the time but they're small but i believe that's what i can do and um, that's the pace i can do it at and i sort of refuse to let anybody else tell me that i got to move faster uh-huh i might listen to them if they told me i had to move more slowly <laughs> but don't don't tell me I have to move faster because I'm I'm moving as fast as I can. <laughs> you paint both figurative and landscape painting. Yeah, it's interesting that, or maybe it's obvious that you can recognize more quickly in a figurative work when it is imaginative than you can with a landscape. I think we have a wider in my work. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I think, you know, we maybe we have a wider range of acceptance for believability in landscapes than we do in the figurative work. But I'm curious, what is it that's fascinating to you about switching back and do you switch back and forth between the two or you continually work on one set? No, entry it's largely seasonal. I paint landscapes when the weather and light permit. In the winter, which we're right in the thick of here now, I tend to work on. I, I do work on some of on some of the older, you know, things I've been working on landscape. I'm. It's not uncommon for me to still be working on a landscape in my studio that I initiated during the summer. At the same time, it is a time that I turn to drawing more and drawing 
in particular from the figure. And I usually develop over the course of a winter some figure paintings based on paintings from life, from a figure, from a model, and or drawings. It's not an imperative for me, but it does turn out this way that by the end of the winter, I have some kind of idea about an invented figure painting based on a series of figure paintings, small figure paintings from life, and many, many drawings from life, hopefully with a particular model. Mm. In the past six or eight years or more, it's been that way. I've been able to find and work with a model that's provided me with a series of drawings and a series of paintings that, again, I think if you look at the website, you'll you'll see figures that are obviously done from life and then the figure compositions, which are, which are invented. And in some cases, you may see the connection between studies and later paintings. But I do, I do work primarily from the landscape and less so, but still very important to me to work in the figure. I'm curious, what, what are you searching for in the, in your figurative work? What is it that's fascinating to you about the figure in particular? There are two figure paintings that I I did five in all, and those are the two that I like the best that I did directly from a model. Uh huh. And I I got to know this model quite well, and this is this is part of it. Is I enjoy working from somebody that you know I can get along with and talk to and. It's a very professional relationship, but at the same time, we get to know each other. The one painting is called Queen Mab Decides, and it's a, of a woman looking, I hope, as if she's just getting out of a chair. Yes. Uh, she's standing up. She's beginning to stand up. But yes. it has a kind of suggestion to me that, that she is about to go into some kind of action, taking control. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how I recalled this. Oh, I know what it is. Is it her hair in that particular painting? She had her hair put up on top of her head in such a way that I looked at it and I said, she looks like Marge Simpson. (laughs) (laughs) I thought she was wearing a crown. (laughs) Well, this is what it triggered. I said, well, at the same time, it looks a, a bit like a crown or a headdress, or something, something that she's put on her head. And, I, and for some reason, I turned her into a, a, a sort of regal. She's a heavy woman, and she has a kind of presence physically. And I, so I said, she looks royalty or something. I, I, so Queen Mab is a, a character out of Chaucer, who also appears in Shakespeare in Midsummer Night's Dream. Queen Mab is somebody that gets into some character of Queen Mab inhabits one's brain and makes one make decisions. So the next painting I did of her, I wanted to get the opposite kind of pose. I wanted a pose that looked like she was regretting some action she had just taken. Uh-huh. So. And she's very much like the body language is very much different. She's yeah, kind of turned away from the viewer and her face is in the shadows. and Yeah. And she, she looks as if she's rethinking an action or, or doubtful. I mean, it's a, it's a gesture that to me summon the opposite kind of state of mind as the first painting. So these are the kind of things that come out of working from life. This is my point. Is it... You end up, you start just by painting somebody sitting out there in a chair, and you end up with a story. Mm. And it has to do with those two poses. And I do, I haven't shown, exhibited them yet, but I, when I do, I hope to exhibit them together because I call one Queen Mab Decides, and the other one is Queen Mab Relents. And the two poses represent two states of mind. So that's, I'm, I'm telling you all that by way of explaining how just a straightforward paint from the model situation can evolve into a dialogue between a couple of pictures. I want to talk a little bit about your process on, on these two paintings. And because now I'm really curious. So you said that she came in 
and she had her hair up and it reminded you of a crown. And then you came up with this narrative from that. So when you initially had her come in, did you have any preconceived ideas whatsoever about what you were going to do? And at what point do you kind of figure out, okay, I'm going to have her be the decisive queen mob and put her in that pose? No, I had no preconceived idea, whatever. This is what I'm saying. It comes through the painting, the suggestion about not only how to think of her in the first painting, but also how to oppose or counterpoint her in the second painting, come through the painting. I probably wouldn't have done the painting, the second painting, were it not for having done the first one, because of The first one has a kind of, as I say, it seems to represent a state of mind of taking action about the woman deciding something. And then the second painting was a response to that. So you did these sequentially then? You did Queen Mob decides and okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got the first one and then I played around with the pose for the second one until I found something that looked like it was... It was suggestive enough of a different different kind of state of mind. So that drove the the image. But again, to, to answer your question, it comes through the painting. I don't have a preconceived idea. Like I say, her hair stacked up on her head looked like Marge Simpson to me. <laughs> and I thought, I got to do something about that. That looks ridiculous. So, you know, I added a sort of headband that looks like a, a little like a tiara. And I think there's some even some flecks of red that sort of represent a flower, you know, some flowers in the, the hair in the second one. But uh-huh. yeah, they, that's all invented. But I asked her to put her hair up because she had very long hair and I wanted to see that her head better. So it wasn't that I was trying to impart royalty to her. <laughs> <laughs> Queen Mab, by the way, is not royalty. She's a fairy. She's a fairy. It's been, I I realized as soon as you said that I was, that I haven't read Shakespeare since probably I was in high school, which is too bad. Well, it's not that I read Shakespeare all the time. I just did remember. I remember the Queen Mab is the one who makes, I think I could be wrong about that, but I think she's in Romeo and Juliet as well. And she gets into Romeo's head. I, I, I don't remember whether it just, it sounds more like Midsummer Night's Dream, but it might be Romeo and Juliet as yeah. well. But I, in any case, I knew that it was, that she was originally a, a, a Middle English literature in Chaucer, and she, she and then Shakespeare used her in some of his things later. That's interesting. I'm sure somebody, somebody somewhere will listen somebody, to this. Somebody, somebody will bring me up. Know the answer and, and yeah, and tell us. <laughs> Correct me, or I can, I guess, go on Wikipedia myself and refresh my <laughs> refresh my memory. But maybe you're I'm making me want to read Shakespeare again. It's really fun. I love Midsummer's <laughs> Night's Dream. Yeah. Well, that's so pictorial. Yeah, I can feel the Italian influence. I guess it's from the color. Like I'm, I feel like on the first one on Queen Mob des- decides that it's because of the colors that that I just feel that influence and something about. The relationship in the lower quarter with her legs and that that deep blue part. Yeah. That just kind of leads me into the other question that I have for you about you go to Italy every year. Is that correct? Now that I'm retired, I don't have a school calendar anymore. And I've been able to spend more time in Italy and more than Karen has. Karen spends as much time as she can there. Her obligation to teaching dictating nine months here and three months there. But I, I have as much as four and a half, five months there and have for the last five or six years. So that's the way I'd like to keep it as long as I can. It's been great and I will never complain about it. It's life, life is not exactly easy on our budget trying to keep two households together. It always sounds much more glamorous, I think, than it, than it really is. It really is. It, I mean, it's, the grass is always greener, but I'm not complaining at all. I'm very lucky to be able to do what I do. Can you talk a little bit about the time that you spend in Italy and what you do when you're there? Do you do you go? Let me just let you tell me what you do, because I've got a million questions that I'll just yeah. badger them all out. So let me have you explain like when you you know, how you how you figure out that time and what you do when you're there. 
Well, an ideal day for me in Italy would be working on various chores on my property. We have a very old farmhouse that it was quite broken down when we bought it. And we bought it for a song. You couldn't possibly buy it for what we bought it for 30 years ago. And we're picking away at it. But picking away at it, again, back to the ideal day, would be working, doing what I need to do, whether it's masonry or gardening or something like that, or running errands in the morning and then getting in the studio by 1 or 2 o'clock and painting till 8 o'clock. That's the way I like to spend every day. That's an ideal day. And I think Karen would concur. Both of us probably get in the same amount of studio time every day. And and, and as I've said, we've raised children there and had a lot of things pulling at us. So it's, it's not that we can just paint all the time. It's uh, unfortunately... I don't think anyone's life is, is like that. I mean, I think we wish, everyone wishes that it were, right? That you... You have eight hours to paint every single day. And I think that is very, very rarely, too, because we have so many other obligations and and life, which we want. Exactly. The times in my life that I had eight hours or nine hours to paint in the studio were not good, really. I mean, (laughs) they if I work three or four good hours a day, that is a day's work for me. And it, I can can be productive. I think that depending on what I'm working on, you know, after I've worked on something three or four or five hours, I'm starting to lose any objectivity about it. It doesn't make sense to continue working. Yeah, I can switch and do something else, but by then I'm too exhausted. So, you know, a good working day is three or four hours on an actual painting, and then other time to you know, do other things in the studio that need to be done. And and maybe that's a different project, drawing or another painting or something like that. But oftentimes it's just stretching canvases or doing whatever you need to do to keep the studio enterprise moving ahead. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. Hi, I'm Sean Cheatham, and I'm part of the Turkel Pro team. You may remember Sean from an interview last year on the podcast. He's a California artist who paints just these gorgeous portraits and figurative works. So aside from the quality of their brushes, I asked Sean what else stands out about Turkel Art Supplies. I love that they're made in California. That's to me something that's nice. You just If you order it through their website, they're such a small company that they're very personable and, and you may end up, if you call, you'll be talking to Courtney, maybe, or whoever, and the brushes will show up very quickly. Sean teaches workshops in Rome every summer, and last year he needed supplies from Trapel. They're making it easy for people, and they ship internationally. When they shipped to Rome, I had a big shipment, and it was, like, pretty quick. So what stands out about Trapel Art Supplies? Made locally more affordable and more durable. I mean, you can't, can't really beat that. And I don't, I'm not just saying that because I'm on the pro team. I was enjoying them before that. It's funny too, because now I actually take better care of my brushes. When I used to use the other brands, I would actually just treat them like disposable brushes. And every time I went to a store, I'd just buy a few brushes because I knew I was just going to beat them up and start millions every time, but I don't do that anymore. Kind of weird how that happens. Go to Trakel.com and use promo code SAVVY16 to get 15% off your next order. Can you talk a little bit about your process, like how you start a painting, like what your what your actual painting process works looks like when you're, you know, like, so you've just been out just to kind of rein it in a little bit, like you've just completed all of your, your chores at your farm in Italy, and now you're, you're going into your studio, what happens? These are all the geeky questions that, you know, the artists love. (laughs) I usually take a book with me to the studio. Most of the time it's an art book, and I'm looking at somebody or or a couple of books, and I'm looking at things that are of interest to me at the time, and then I get excited about it. It's not that my image up there on the easel has looks anything like the thing in the book I'm looking at, but it just necessarily, sometimes it does, but... It's just a way of getting 
in front of my own work by means of some other inspiration and sort of catalyst. So that's how I usually start a day. And sometimes that's 15 minutes and sometimes it's an hour before I really start working. Who are some of the artists that you're looking at? I look at, I've mentioned Sienese painting. The last couple of years, I've been looking at uh, a lot of Sienese paintings. I just find it just a, a vast amount of information and, and inspiration and surprise, as much as anything. The other, again, I was thinking about, you ask about books that I might recommend. Oh, please do. Well, I just got a, a book about a painter named Fausto Pirandello. Pirandello Fausto is the son of the playwright Luigi Pirandello. And he's a wonderful, wonderful painter who I think died in 1970 something, 72, 73. But he lived and did wonderful paintings between the wars, World War I and World War II. He was sort of peripherally connected to the Scuola Romana, School of Rome between the wars. And he's a painter that is not well known, and certainly in the U.S., but he is a wonderful painter like many, many of his contemporaries were. And maybe you know some of them, but there are an awful lot of painters during that period that were doing things that are remarkably similar to what painters like myself and others were doing in the 70s, 80s, before they all died off. Morandi being the most uh, well-known of them. Mm. But Morandi was actually not really the school of Romani. He, was, he, would, he started off as a metaphysical painter like the Chirico. Anyway, there are, there are many, many painters. Again, Morandi's perhaps the best known or, known, or Carlo Carà. But there are, I'd say, 25, 30 painters that were up until 10 years ago barely known to me and I've uh, I've worked pretty hard at looking them up and finding the books I could find them going to see shows that are in Italy and occasionally elsewhere but but not so much here in the US so yeah I I look at them a lot I look at Baltus as more contemporary painter mm-hmm. that it's been important to me as he has to many many people and I have a long list. Yeah, yeah, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a great start and a great point. I mean, I think that that gives a, you know, if somebody's looking at your work and wants to dig a little deeper, then that gives definitely gives an idea of at least where to start. And yeah, clearly, I think like all if I had to list every single artist, <laughs> it'd be like we'd be on the phone for like three hours, and I'm sure more for you. Yeah, I know. And many of them. I've been looking at since I was a very young man, and many of them are new, and many of them I didn't understand when I was a very young man. I mean, I can, the Bonard is an example of somebody that came to me later in life. As I always knew who he was, and I was always sort of aware of him, but he didn't impress himself upon me as a very young painter in the way that he did, but when I was 40, 35, 40 years old. What do you think? I'm curious. I'm always curious about that because I think we look at, there have definitely been artists that I looked at and was immediately pulled to when I was younger or just starting painting. And there were others that I was just like, what's the big deal? Why is everybody freaking out over this? You know, it's nice, but yeah. why? what's the big deal? So I'm curious, because that's a great example with Bernard. What was it that you saw in later on in your 40s and stuff 40s, you know, like later on that you weren't able to, that you didn't notice before or didn't appreciate? Well, I guess I would say that I came to Bonard by way of Cezanne. Cezanne, I think I realized something important about what was missing in my own painting through thinking about Cezanne earlier than Bonard, which was that trying to, trying to establish surface tension between two and three dimensions so that things would sit in space but at the same time that they would assert themselves on the surface i think prior for the earlier part of my the earlier part of my effort was just to make three-dimensional space to make things sit in three-dimensional space but as time went on i began to find myself drawn to people that not only 
could represent something sitting in space, but also bring it back to the surface. And I think that was a huge revelation to me that, oh, this is what a painting is really about. And, you know, I, I, it was a breakthrough when I finally figured that out. And Cezanne comes to mind as a person that taught me that. I mean, I suppose if, if I'd had any real feeling and, and intellectually and understood cubism, but I didn't have any feeling for it emotionally. But then it, as I began to see it in the presence, as see it manifest, see a cubist idea manifest in the paintings of people that I admired, like Bonnard later, certainly Cezanne, but Bonnard even more so because his color was so incredibly beautiful yeah. and appealed to me. But his his willingness to flatten form and then open up a space next to a flattened form and then close it up again, open it and close it, just make a breathing two- and three-dimensional space. It's just remarkable to me. And he was, I just can't think of many people that are better at that than he is. But I didn't realize that when I was 25. Right. You know, if you shown me a Bernard at 25, I'd say, oh, yeah, I've, I remember him in books. You know, I know, he was a contemporary of Matisse, wasn't he? <laughs> I mean, I, it was, you know, I, I could place him art historically, but I didn't, it didn't have any meaning to me. Right. So that's the wonderful thing, as, as you, I'm sure, have experienced. Uh, is that you come to different artists at different times. Yeah. And you're aware of the others and you're wondering whether they're ever going to mean something to you. They may or they may not. But, you know, they happen over the course of looking a lot, uh, over the course of a lifetime, because you, you you come to different realizations about your own work. And then you see those people's work and you say, ah, that's what he or she is about. And that's what I want to find out more about. Yeah, I think usually you're looking for the solution to a problem. So I think that's why it's so common for early on for artists to really appreciate painters who, like you said, can put the apple on the table in space and make it, you know, so that you can feel the weight. Yeah. And then once you've mastered that, you start looking for the next, or you have the next question. So you start looking for people who might have been asking the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but what you just described, again, going back to the, our earlier remark, that takes a long time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that. That takes a, that, so, so, again, the increments of progress or the increments of revelation to somebody doing what I'm doing and I think you may be doing, too, is they're very small compared to what the art world expects of people. And I think it's getting worse now, too, it feels like, because we're sort of training ourselves to, I think it's a societal thing and a technological thing that we have. I feel like I'm, I have to really resist my expectation for instant gratification. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, I mean you, you can get the, grat you have to get the gratification you need from your work. If you depend on it from things external, you're invariably going to be disappointed because it'll happen once in a while, but yeah, not in the rapid fire way that really feels good and validates what you do. You have to be able to validate it in the privacy of your own studio. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Which brings me to one of your last questions. How do you keep your creative spark? And that's a pretty ponderous question, especially <laughs> when one, tries to do other things, tries to raise a family, tries to... Have a life. <laughs> yeah, have a life. Yeah, have other kind of interests and, and things to do. And those are the kind of experiences that indirectly enrich the art, but there just aren't enough hours in the day to do them. So keeping painting forefronted becomes increasingly difficult, especially in a world where the art world takes away the urgency of doing something. It's not like people are banging on my door to buy my work or put me in shows or anything. So it's not mm. like I have, to, I have to work feverishly to get things done by deadlines because 
it was maybe more that way 20, 30 years ago, but the culture changed, and I understand that. It's not shouldn't be a surprise. The culture has changed, and, and people's expectation about what art is or function it has and a social fabric is just different now. I don't have that, that same perspective that you do. How do you think it's changed in the last 30 years, 30, 40 years? Well, the easiest way I can say it is William Bailey – former teacher of mine and friend, William Bailey's painting of a half-nude figure was on the cover of Newsweek magazine in 1976. Now, Newsweek no longer makes a hard copy magazine, but it used to be like Time, and it was a huge deal. And there was a in that particular issue, there was a whole very developed article, which is unusual as well, that it was given that much space in a magazine about representational painting. Wow, in Newsweek. Yeah, it was the kind of heyday. of, And for all of us young, I was 25 or something at the time, but all of us young painters sort of thought, oh, this is this is the art world, but it, it wasn't. It just the ground is under your feet. It's shifting all the time, and that's what you have to remember. Right. That's that is really fascinating because I I feel like I do have you know like kind of vague memories of seeing long form articles on art in general magazines, and I cannot imagine Time Magazine spending any time on the arts unless something sold for like $20 million and it was more of a financial conversation than an artistic conversation. Yeah. Well, that particular cover generated so much mail to Newsweek because it was a half-length nude. Oh, no. It was just scandalous. So aside from being a sensation to to artists because it was all about the issue was all about art so that was shocking in and of itself but to the rest of the american readership of newsweek it was scandalous because of the picture which is i'm sure what they intended bare flesh yeah. anyway <laughs> so so that's close to a nutshell as i can give you is yeah. that it was in the air at the time and people and it was representational so the public had a kind of way of accessing it that they don't now Right. So it's a time that's come and gone. That's over. If you think that that is the condition under which you're working, then it gives some urgency to your work in the studio because you want to get your own work out there and in this wave of public apprehension. But in fact, it really is not happening like that anymore and uh so that ur- that urgency is pulled out yeah That's not a factor anymore what you're doing is you're doing it essentially for yourself and also your painting community such as it is right and you you're not doing it to put bread on the table because that's probably not going to happen so you're doing it for for a different combination of reasons. But there was a time when, you know, people had some expectation that they could sell work and, and make a make a life. I know people that left teaching jobs because they were selling enough work thinking, okay, I can make a living doing this. And that dried up very quickly. You don't think that exists anymore? Oh, I think plenty, plenty of artists can make a living. But I don't think so many people doing representational painting that has a kind of traditional in a sense that it is earnest and felt it's certainly not the mainstream right now it's it's totally marginalized and there is an audience for it but it's again it's it's hard to build a life i think or certainly to raise a family thinking that you can pay figures landscapes and still life and make a living doing it. I think that's a stretch. (laughs) From your perspective, it sounds like there's been just such a massive shift in the public's appreciation of art. Do you think that's true? I mean, do you think people care about art anymore outside of painters, outside of the artists themselves and their small circles? And I say small smart circles, just let me just <laughs> elaborate on that. Like the small circle would be, you know, like we're, I'm just thinking in terms of world population and the people who, who genuinely appreciate arts. Well, the 
much has been written and said about the commodification of art, and that is that is fact. I mean, it's just the way it is now. So the kind of work I do, it's really quite marginalized in terms of public. It doesn't connect to ideas about commodification. Mm-hmm. I'm not a wonderful investment. <laughs> If anybody wanted to buy my work for that reason. Yeah, and just that term that people think of it in terms of investment as opposed to yeah. bringing beauty into their home. You know, there there is, and this is one of the good things about Facebook that I've come in my cynical old age to realize is that there are lots and lots of very, very good painters out there that are doing remarkably good work. And I just am always amazed when I go through the reel on Facebook about about the number of people. Most of my friends on Facebook are artists, so I see really, really good things. And I just always wonder, you know, how they're doing. They're obviously making good work. So it's not that it doesn't thrive in some pockets and areas and certainly outside of New York City, there's lots of lots of very good painting being done, and and your some of your colleagues, Larry Groff, comes to mind as somebody that turns them up and mm-hmm. talks about. Them. So I have no doubt about that. But how hard those people are having to scramble in order to do what they do is another question. I, I don't know. It's tough. Yeah. It's definitely tough. Yeah, it it is. It is very tough. I know we're both preaching to the choir, but yeah, it is it is very difficult. And it used to be that that you could get a teaching job or at least had a shot at te- getting a teaching job, but as you well know, the plethora of MFAs now just make that all the more remote and more difficult. Yeah. And to compound on that, you have so many of the universities going to adjunct professors where you don't, you can't, what's the point? (laughs) I mean, like, aside from teaching because you want to, but if you're, if you're looking for a stable profession so that you have the ability to paint, I don't think university teaching is it anymore. I think that that's gone, which is going to have the downward effect of when the serious artist, I'm doing the air quotes there, you know, but when people who are really devoted to painting no longer are willing to kind of feels like donate their time to the universities and what's going to happen to the students is the, you know, the ripple effect of that, that I often wonder about. Yeah. Honestly, it, you know, if there's a silver lining to that, I think that it is, yeah, that the very talented, very hardworking painters who teach at the universities will no longer do that and they'll do it on their own, which will make yeah. for your own personal MFAs. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I think there are always going to be forms that come up in the absence of structures, academic structures that are no longer viable. The example being something I know you've experienced, that you can have very rich and wonderful and really productive summer programs or workshops or or residencies or things like that. I mean, there are other forms that can will fill some sort of void that the one I, I hope that you're you're talking of. Yeah. It's interesting because when you think about it, it's sort of the chickens coming home to roost in a way, in the sense that my perception at least is that a lot of the universities got really, really greedy and started charging enormous amounts of money to study with them. And then this is an outside perspective, but, you know, it looks to me like it's a lot of it is greed and then saying, you know, like, okay, we want a little bit more. So let's cut the teacher's salaries. Let's cut the professors and go to adjuncts. And I think they're, they're slitting their own throats. And in a way, like, I think that it's the same thing that happened with the music industry and some of the effects that we're seeing in the gallery industry with the advent of all the technology that we have, that we can go directly to the people that we need to go directly. And we don't need the middleman anymore. Yeah. They're kind of <laughs> digging their own graves, I think. Well, certainly the expression adjunct hell has taken on a whole new meaning in the last 10 years or so, because so many full lines have been cut from various 
university curricula and departments that the people that are essentially just stringers that come in and teach a course for no money and can't really make a living even doing that no. and are having to compromise sometimes their own pedagogical wishes uh, in order to fit some little job that just gets them through for a semester. It's just really, really frustrating. And as you say, ultimately detrimental to any student trying to look for continuity and, and a sort of constructive, productive four-year experience. Yeah. It's a pretty depressing and distressing thing. However, I mean, having heard and thought about your conversation with Karen Kanier, I think one of the things that comes through is that even though that's not an art school, the the wish on the part of technologically oriented students, the wish for them to make something and to image something, is something that never really gets completely sublimated or suppressed. And so that it's it's a, it's an ongoing potential yeah that's always there to be addressed and developed so i don't know i'm not completely bleak in my outlook about that no but it's just so fascinating to think about because when you look at what's happening in every other industry with all the advent of technology and then to sort of apply those thoughts to what's happening in the art world it gets really interesting to start thinking about the future i know that I am way over my time with you. So I, I want to ask you one more question, but I want to sure, make sure you're sure. okay. Are you okay on time? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Okay. Sure. So with that in mind, I'm curious. Yeah, one of those questions that I that I had in there that you probably see is where do you think the the art market is going in the next five to 10 years? Or what do you think is? <laughs> the look on your face is like, please don't ask me that question. <laughs> No, well, we said early on, I won't say, I won't answer it. I'll just say I can't answer it. <laughs> the better question, which I'll try to answer your question with, is another question of yours, which was, that what would you advise uh -huh. the artist you were 10 years ago? Okay. And I'll try to answer that and say that the awareness I have now of how momentary and how capricious the art world is, you can't think that in my case, for example, that having been established, well established in a commercial gallery, having had four one person shows in a New York gallery, means that you have arrived at a certain place. It means that you've had some good breaks, but that gallery is now closed. And the kind of work I do, I'm just not, people can say nice things about it, admire it, and occasionally maybe you've even purchased one, but it's, it doesn't come through the system anymore because it's not, it's not on the cutting edge. And so I guess my advice to myself 10 years ago is don't expect things to be so sequential. They're just not because the art market is, is in a state of flux always, mm. which is not to say the representation of painters aren't, surfacing here and there but the kind of painter that i admire you might see occasionally but for the most part certainly in, in the new york art world irony still prevails as a kind of cultural idiom that is manifest in in painting and it's not something i'm interested in mm -hmm. and so the things that i create and people i admire create things that are genuinely felt and they they aspire to some some idea about beauty and so that isn't the currency the representation of painting that you do see that is uh, in the galleries these days it's just totally rarefied at this point the kind of thing that that i'm looking for mm. so what else is new is it's what i'm saying is it's like to myself 10 years ago, so what did you expect? <laughs> a man I, I knew not terribly well, but a little bit, named Andrew Forge, you might have heard of. He, mm -hmm. he in a commencement address to his students at, one, at the studio school at one point, he said, nobody asked you to make these paintings. So it's like 
okay, that there's a lot in that statement. It's like there's no payoff that you can expect externally. Your question about the art market, I, I don't know which way it's going to turn, but I ain't looking for it to turn my way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you can answer this question. This might be an I don't know, but where do you think that leaves us? Well, again, I when I see remarkably good work coming out of people that I don't personally know, but you know, I know of, or I get to meet them at some point, or or there's some kind of venue that brings us together, I realize that the community is important, and there are people out there that can speak your language. And you just have to work at it a little bit to find them. But a writer writes, a painter paints, you just do what you, you do and find the gratification you can and hope that a break and hope that some kind of validation comes along. But if it doesn't, you've got to be prepared for that as, as much as you can. You just have to do it for your community and for yourself. Yeah. I do believe that so much about painting world now right now has to do with identity and political but I, do, I believe that all good painting is essentially political because you're saying to somebody, you're saying to an audience, a viewer, you're saying, I had this experience, it looked like this, and for a moment I want you to see it the way I see it. So you're trying to persuade somebody mm -hmm. to experience something the way you've experienced it, which is essentially a political act. So making that apple sit on the tabletop still has, it's not a big statement, but it's still a political statement. So it, that has value, and I don't know, it has, has consequence, at least for the artist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, everything that we're talking about is make, just making me think about where we are right now as a society and our, you know, I think society as a whole has a preference right now to focus on the superficial level, to not go too deep, to stay in the headlines and not actually think deeply or dig deeply to find out what's really going on. And maybe that's what's happening in the art market as well. Yeah, no, I, I completely hear you, which is one of the reasons why going to Italy is, again, I know we're trying to close things up here, but going to Italy is refreshing also in the sense that besides the obvious which is you see thousands of years worth of art and people having worked at it but the culture itself in italy the contemporary culture is more appreciative and embraces it mm. differently than american culture does i mean american culture is so separated out you know being an artist and identifying yourself as an artist in italy has a different resonance yeah than it does here if you identify yourself as an artist here people are going to move away from you true <laughs> and if you do it there it's uh it's a different perception so that too sort of makes me realize that doesn't have to be this way and there are places where it's not this way yeah like if you identify yourself as an artist in the united states i think people assume that you're unemployed or that you're not working and when they say not working that you're not making x amount of money that you're not in the the top 10 percent or whatever numbers in their head yeah and when, I don't know if you know this, but I lived in Argentina for six years up until, you know, kind of last year. And I've been to Italy a bit, as you know, I've been to Italy also yeah. and traveled quite a bit. And most other countries, when you say you're an artist, their eyes light up and they want to know what you do. And they're not asking questions like, how much do you make? How much do you spend your, like, how, how much do you spend? sell your paintings for and how long do they take because I want to figure out how much you make per square inch or per hour. You know, it's not a, yeah. a mathematical financial equation. It's, wow, that's really interesting. Let's talk about art. Yeah, I, I this is, we'll save it for another conversation entry. But as of a year ago, we have a daughter-in-law who's Argentinian. And I remember talking to her father about the culture. And he, he was saying that exactly what you just said that the perception of an artist there is really different from other places in the world that he he traveled quite a bit and he said that forget what he said he said everybody is in argentina is either a 
designer, an artist, a psychiatrist, yeah. or an engineer. Oh, so, I, w- I would have said psychiatrist yeah. or lawyer. Like almost everybody yeah. I talked to was either a psychiatrist. I was like, why does Argentina have so many psychiatrists and lawyers? Right. He may have said lawyer. I don't remember, but I do remember that he said artist and designer. Oh, architect. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I feel like there's a ton yeah. of architects. Okay, go on. Well, anyway, the point being that this is a particularly bad moment. And I'm not sure that, well, again, it's too long yeah. conversation now. But, uh, you know, I don't I don't think that, except, well, I, I don't know. One thinks of the WPA, the one, or, or the NEA, when it existed in a form that really helped artists. There aren't too many initiatives on the part of the government that would make one think that the public did, in fact, have a vested interest in artists being present at all. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so again, I'm I'm very lucky to be able to leave and be refreshed by a different culture, a different way of thinking. And I know that and I appreciate being able to do that. Langdon, thank you so much. My pleasure. As always, I want to thank you for listening to the Savvy Painter podcast. And a big thank you, of course, to Langdon Quinn for being so candid in this episode. Show notes for this episode can be found at SavvyPainter.com. And then just click on the podcast tab. You'll find Langdon's episode there. And you can see examples of his work, including Queen Mob Decides and Queen Mob Relents. You definitely want to check that out. Plus, you'll also find links to all of the artists that we talked about in this week's episode. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helps several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no I'm putting air quotes there. She had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned. But more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.